One of my favorite anecdotal stories is the story of the minister who invited the children down for the children's time as we do here each Sunday. And once the children all gathered at the chancel rail, he held up a picture of a frog. And he said, now children, when you see this picture of the frog, what do you think about? Well, immediately the little boy shot his hand up and he said, God. And the preacher said, well, son, that's interesting. Why did you immediately think about God when you saw this picture of the frog? And he said, well, I knew you didn't bring us all the way down here just to talk about frogs. <laughs> and he's right. Worship is not about routine business. Worship is not about trite matters. Worship is not even about long established practices that have become a part of worship tradition in the Christian faith. Worship is far more important than that. And so this morning, I want to share with you four things that I believe about worship. First of all, worship is first and foremost about God. Worship first and foremost is about God. You know, I think we've got it wrong most of the time. You and I come to worship believing that worship is about meeting our needs, our desires, and our wishes, and our talk in a few moments about the benefits of worship. But the fact is, you and I need to understand this, worship is first and foremost about God. It is not about pleasing you or pleasing me. It is about pleasing God. We've all heard that old statement uh, people make, uh, you need to, to get over yourself. Well, I'm going to tell you rather bluntly this morning, we need to get over ourselves. Worship, again, is not about pleasing you, and it is not about pleasing me. It is about pleasing God. And that has several uh, applications for your life and for mine as we gather in worship. First of all, it means that when we come here, when we make the effort to get here, we're not doing so just so we can check off that we've been to church on Sunday morning. We're doing it so we can say every Sunday morning that our primary loyalty is to God. When God is first and foremost in our lives in worship, then we make the effort to be here because we want to register that God matters to us. Secondly, it means that when we sing energetically, enthusiastically, it's not about whether we like to sing or whether we can sing. It's about singing praises to God. When we open that hymn book and we sing these hymns, it's not really about whether you can sing or not or whether you like to sing or I like to sing. It's about the truth that we need to be singing praises to God. It also means that worship is not about you listening to me or to whomever is preaching on Sunday morning. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that you want to hear the sermons. But the fact is, I understand this and I hope you understand this. You're not here to hear Richard Smith you are here to hear God. And I'm wise enough to know that not everything I say is from God. I'm wise enough to know that every Sunday morning I'm inadequate to the fullness of God's truths. But I hope when you come here, you are listening some way, somehow for God to speak while I speak. And it means that when we go through the prayers and the liturgy, it doesn't matter whether they're moving and inspiring or, or emotional or not. We go through that liturgy, we go through the aspects of worship so that we can say to God, we want to join Him in Christian worship. I love the way Howard Owes put it some years ago when he said, worship is not about the style of clothes or the style of music. Worship is not about the building or the band. Worship is not about the liturgy or the lack of it. Charismatic preachers and creative dramas are not essential to worship. Worship is not even about great musicians and talented choirs, though they have been known to redeem many a feeble preacher on a Sunday morning. And choir, thank you so much for the many occasions on which you redeem this feeble preacher. He goes on to say, worship is about God. The question is not, did worship please me? The question is, did my worship please God? Or as another theologian puts it, we say by our very presence in worship, you are God. You are first in my life, and yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and for me. Secondly, I would say worship is a time and place for God to refuel us. Worship is a time and place for God to refuel us. 
I would describe our particular time and our culture for most of us as harried, hurried, and worried. I doubt there's a one of you in this sanctuary this morning who would disagree with that assessment. That for the most part, our lives are harried, hurried, and worried. And so on any given Sunday morning, including this Sunday morning, so many of you come spiritually and emotionally depleted. You come mentally exhausted. You come physically fatigued, and I understand that. I know you come here because you need refueling. I come here because I need refueling. I love this passage in the 95th Psalm when the psalmist reminds us of these things. For He is our God, and we are the people of His pasture, the flock under His care. You hear those words? He is our God. He is our shepherd. And this shepherd cannot wait to refuel us, to strengthen our spirits, to nourish our souls, to help our depleted emotional and spiritual selves. In worship, you have the opportunity and I have the opportunity to open our spirits up anew and let this God refuel us and refresh us so we can return to our harried, hurried, and worried lives better off. This scene in the fourth chapter of the Gospel of Luke is a telling one. It's a simple scene. Jesus uh, re comes to Galilee, and then he returns to Nazareth. And when he comes to Nazareth, Luke says, in a very simple phrase, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. Those are powerful words, as was his custom. The custom of Jesus was to go to church. The custom of Jesus every time he entered a new community or a new town was to go to church. Church mattered to Jesus. And let me tell you two reasons church mattered to Jesus. It mattered to Jesus, first of all, because as I said in the beginning, he wanted to glorify God. But it mattered to Jesus, secondly, because he needed worship. After walking the dusty trails of Palestine and preaching and healing hundreds, if not thousands, Jesus needed a place and a time He could come when He could simply let God refuel Him. Richard Brainshard in the 1970s wrote a, a gospel piece that sums it up, and you know this. Fill my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I won't no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. That is worship. Thirdly, worship helps, helps us get our moral bearings. Worship helps us get our moral bearings. I read recently a listing of the critical moral issues that you and I face in our, in our particular time. It's an exhausting list. Listen to this. These are the issues, the moral issues that we face in our day and time. Abortion, alternate lifestyles, war and peace in an age of terrorism, rogue nations with nuclear weapons, the possibilities and the limits of heroic medical efforts, global warming and our contemporary lifestyles, immigration, lives of comfort and wealth in the midst of vast global poverty and hunger, our nation's responsibility or limitations for international action or intervention, the right to bear arms, death with dignity, capital punishment. I mean, you go down that list and you are emotionally and mentally and morally exhausted, aren't you? And you think, how in the world do I find some answer to these complex, very complex moral issues about which I have to make some decision as a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not going to tell you on Sunday morning here at Germantown United Methodist Church that you're going to come and get answers to all of these. You know that. I'm not going to tell you that in a year's time we will speak to all of these particular moral issues, but I'm going to tell you this. You will come to this place. You will come to this sanctuary, and you'll be reminded of two things. You'll be reminded that the proper response to every moral issue is to seek God's will. Whatever the moral issue, you're reminded in worship that you and I are to seek God's will. And I don't care if you go to a Baptist church or a Lutheran church, an Episcopal church or a Pentecostal church or a Catholic church. It doesn't matter the Christian church or the Christian denomination. On every Sunday morning, Every person who participates in worship is going to be reminded you need to seek God's will. Secondly, we're going to be reminded that the Bible matters. 
and that the Bible is the, the essential resource book for all our decisions. What do I say when I read the text on Sunday morning and I assume our other clergy do this as well? I hold this Bible up and what I say I mean. I read the text and then I say what? The Word of God this day for us, the people of God. Where is the primary place that you and I discern God's will? It is here in this book. And so worship, as we face the complex moral issues of our time, reminds you and me, we seek God's will, and we seek it through Holy Scripture. And finally, I would say to you this morning, worship gives us our weekly assignment. I don't know if you thought about that or not, but worship gives us a weekly assignment. In the past two churches that I pastored, first of all in Paducah, Kentucky for seven years, then in Murray, Kentucky for seven years, as you know by now, I would end every worship service uh, before giving the benediction by stepping before the congregation and raising my arms and saying, heads up and eyes open. So when I went to, to Broadway Methodist in Paducah on that first Sunday and I prepared to give the benediction, they all bowed their heads, ready to receive the benediction. And I said, with my hands up, heads up and eyes open. And somebody asked me about that later. Why did you do that, preacher? Why did you say heads up and eyes open? Aren't we supposed to have our heads bowed when you do the benediction? And I said, no, no, you need to pay attention. There's an assignment here. You and I have been here in worship. And listen to this. God is preparing us to go out there and change the world. What happens in here? is that you and I might be strengthened that we can go into the world and change the world. I took that same practice to Murray, Kentucky, and I had a few folks grumble, you know, because again, they thought you got to be bowing before God before you go. And I say, no, you've got to be attentive. You've got to listen so you know your assignment. One Christian thinker summed it up well when he asked these questions. Who will go and tell others that God loves them? Who will go out and help the distressed recognize there is hope for their problems? Who will go and show others the difference belief in God makes? Who will go and offer words of encouragement to those weary with life's demands? Who will go to the poor and the downtrodden and offer a helping hand? Who will go to the lonely and offer a caring touch and a kind word? Who will go, guess who? Who will go from this place? Guess who? You and me, prepared by God to go into the world in order to change the world. So worship is not about frogs. It's not about routine business. It's not about trite things. Worship, first and foremost, is about God, about pleasing God about glorifying God. Now, as we come to glorify God and praise Him, wonderfully, He refuels us so that we can go into our hurried, harried, and worried lives and do better. And right here, you have a foundation for the moral choices you've got to make to seek God's will and to find it in Holy Scripture. And right here, you and I are prepared that we can go for our weekly assignment. Thanks be to God. Amen.